to the 99 where we're focused on brewing a better competitive commander. I am your host Patrick Marlette and today we are continuing our conversation on Savala, Heart of the Wilds. This salty salty girl is a fantastic mono green commander. If you don't know what she does yet, go ahead and watch my two previous videos on this card and I not only demonstrate how to net infinite mana with her, but show you how to win the game with Savala by turn three. I have received a few questions in regards to Savala, Heart of the Wilds and what is in my 99, my primer. Most notable what's been excluded. Well, if you haven't guessed from the title of this video, we are talking about those notable exclusions today, as well as some budget options if you're looking to construct this particular deck. Now, this might be the only commander on the show we discuss budget options for, as she's unique in that there are budget options for some of those more expensive cards. My idea of budget being 50 and under, and I know that might not be the same for a lot of you. When you think of budget, you probably think of five and under in most cases. Unfortunately for CDH, there are cards that are unavoidable. Some of those fast mana cards cost $20, $30. You're gonna have to spend a little bit more money if you wanna budgetize a CDH deck. So we're not gonna have the same level of power as playing with something like Guy's Cradle, but we'll get there. And of course, we'll talk about that near the tail end of this video. And in front of us, I have seven of what I would consider the most notable exclusions from most Savala primers. And from right to left, we have Hunted Troll, the Woodland Bellower, Fierce Empath, Birds of Paradise, Fauna Shaman, Priest of Titania, as well as Instill Energy. Now in no particular order, let's go ahead and talk about these cards and why I think they're less than optimal for your Savala deck. Hunted Troll is a unique offering for the Savala list. It is a four CMC creature that is eight four in the power defense department. That's fantastic. And I actually really like the catch ability of this card in providing one of my opponents four flying fairies. Now, why do I like the four flying fairies? Well, CEDH is notorious for not having a lot of creatures on deck. And for all those partner commanders out there, I'm, I'm looking at you, Timna. It's great to be able to give at least one of our opponents a means to defend against those thrashing Timnas. When Timna comes swinging in to draw cards, well, we say no to that by giving one of our opponents fairies to play with. However, I find the cost for Hunted Troll to be a tad too much. It doesn't allow me to accelerate my game as quickly as I would like. I try to reduce the cost of my deck as much as possible while still retaining those powerful creatures. So in my opinion, Phyrexian Soul Gorger comes in instead of this guy. And if you're not following along on the tapped out primer, go ahead and go to that link in the description for the Stampede Savala Heart of the Wild CEDH if you want to see the cards I'm talking about. Again, Hunted Troll is just fine, but a little too expensive for this deck. This next exclusion is a little bit contentious for some as they demand on having it in their Savala decks. However, I don't feel that Woodland Bellowers is a strong enough card to have in the primer. Now, while he alone can activate an infinite mana combo if he hits the field, it is a very predictable card for your opponents to read into. If they see Woodland Bellowers coming out, well, odds are likely they're going to stop it right then and there. Woodland Bellower by itself is just a very expensive creature tutor that is broadcasting to everyone what our intentions are. We have much more cost-effective, powerful creatures, let alone buff spells littered throughout our deck. Not only that, we have things like Eldritch Evolution, Court of Calling, Green Sun Zenith that are far more affordable, I mean cost-effective ways to put the creature we want on the battlefield for less and still have mana left over. Not to mention that the deck is running with a lot of draw potential that goes far beyond the potential of this one card. Let's go ahead and bring our converted CMC average down by excluding the Woodland Bellower. Trust me, you don't wanna be spending six mana on this guy. And on that note, Fierce Empath. Woo, Fierce Empath. Folks really love running this guy. I, I can kind of understand why he tutors something to your hand, but that thing needs to be six CMC or more. And if you look at my particular primer with Woodland Bellower gone, we only have one creature that costs six CMC or more, and that is our Great Oak Guardian. And trust me, we're really not trying to put him in our hand through this card. There has never been an instance where I've looked at this card and said to myself, you know, with three mana, I can put Great Oak Guardian in my hand. Let's do that. No, bad, bad Fierce Empath. The elf tribal thing, it's great. We can use that in our infinite mana loops. However, I'm not running Priest of Titania, so I don't really need another elf. And this guy is literally grabbing one card for three mana. It's not worth it, at least in my deck list. There might be one that leverages the heck out of this elf. 
It's not gonna go in this particular primer though. As a matter of fact, instead of Fierce Empath, I would recommend the folks using this card to consider this little guy, the Tree Folk Harbinger, because guess what? He pulls Tree Folk or Forest cards out of your deck. That could be your Dryad Arbor, that could be your Great Oak Guardian. Heck, if you run Lignify, that's another option for this card to be pulling out of your deck. Now, mind you, it would put it on top of your deck, but with Savala, we're drawing cards when we play big old creatures, and you can set this up to draw the card with cards in our deck. Lignify, by the way, turns your opponent's commander into a nothing zero four tree. It's fantastic for this deck as an option. I've currently sideboarded these two cards out in my version of Savala Heart of the Wilds. I find that there are more efficient cards to be in place for them. However, if you're going to use a creature to tutor for anything in your deck, trust me, he is a better option. Unless you're using Woodland Bellowers in your deck and you've got 10 mana on your turn, you drop the Fierce Empath, you drop the Woodland Bellowers, you, you still have that one mana remaining, you untap the Savala, and hopefully everyone's allowed you to do that and you, you go off in some miraculous way, but I don't see it working out that well. Our next notable exclusion are the birds. The birds of paradise, they're great in a lot of green decks. However, in a mono green deck like Savala, unless this said elf bird, we don't really want to consider it. Now, if you watched our first video on Savala Heart of the Wilds, you'll know why we've excluded this card already, but it's worth mentioning again if you haven't watched that video yet. This card is fantastic in a lot of regards. It can generate any color mana. It's fantastic for multicolored decks. However, in this list, we don't want it because the birds are not elves. Our deck's most effective infinite mana loops utilize elves. And if we're not dropping elves on our turn one, we are effectively stunting our game. My list features 14 ways to get Savala out on turn two. I found that to be the magic number. That is the secret sauce for my deck. 14 is perfect in conjunction with land grant. If you want to hear more about that card, watch that first video. However, we don't need Birds of Paradise in this deck. It's great otherwise, we don't want it in Savala. Our next notable exclusion is Fauna Shaman. Now, Fauna Shaman is used in a lot of decks with Priests of Titania because Titania can ramp off of those baddies, and there's a lot of ways to generate infinite mana with Titania herself, but the Priest isn't in the command zone, Savala is. And Fauna Shaman is less than Survival of the Fittest, which we run. Essentially, Fauna Shaman is Survival of the Fittest on a stick. If you don't know what that ability is, it lets you discard creatures to find creatures. We're not really trying to tutor for Fauna Shaman. It's great if it's in your hand, but it is slow. Unless we've played Concordant Crossroads, which is part of our win condition in this deck. In all regards, Fauna Shaman is just a lesser Survival of the Fittest, and we honestly don't need both in our deck. Which leads me perfectly into our next notable exclusion. Now, if you just heard me harping off there on this card, I really don't like it in this deck. It's slow, it's taking up position over Savala. On turn two, we're really looking to cast Savala, not Priest of Titania. She's fantastic. She loves the elves, she makes the mana off the elves. We don't need her. The Priest is a great backup plan if Savala doesn't check out. If we're going against a board that is hating Savala hard, guess what? Priest can help you. However, game plan A, our goal is always to play Savala on turn two, and not only that, keep her on the field by all means possible. We are running rocks and enough effective mana in our land base to place Savala on the field successively if she gets countered or pongified or whatever the situation is, she will hit the field. Again, she is plan A. We don't want to operate under plan B, which is playing the priest. And there's a few games where this can bite us in the ass. And you know what? That's okay, because we are playing a Savala deck, okay? The, the number one reason we play a Savala deck is to play Savala. It's really a double-edged sword. When you have a commander that is as vital to your game's plan as Savala is, it can go one of two ways. Perfectly leading to your victory, or horribly leading to your defeat. Now, I made the choice to have Savala Heart of the Wilds as my commander, not the priest, so we're gonna stick with her. And you'll notice that my priest of Titania is sleeved up, and that's because sometimes 
if I'm playing against a group that's really hating Savala, maybe I do need to put her in. However, I will state that with my primer, there isn't really enough support for her in the elf department to really get her going. So she's still suboptimal in this particular list of 99. However, I'll leave that choice up to you as to whether you place her in your deck or not. I think it's better to exclude her, particularly if you're looking at my primer, but if yours is different from mine, she might function just as well for you. The last notable exclusion is in Still Energy, and there are a lot of shenanigans to be had with this card. It's very rare that the top ability actually plays any effective part in our deck strategy. The creature that's enchanted being unaffected by summoning sickness, essentially giving it haste. It's very rare that we'll use that in a meaningful way. What's more important is the zero cost activated ability that allows you to untap enchanted creature. It's great. It sounds great on paper. However, if you look over my primer, you know that our first goal, our first action should be playing Savala on turn two. If we do that, our goal then is to win on turn three. So does this help us win on turn three? It really doesn't. On turn three, we really wanna be playing our one CMC buff spells or our big creatures, leaving us with just enough mana remaining to tap out on Savala and start stirring up the Stampede. This card here doesn't quite allow us to effectively stir the Stampede up, not as much as the untap creatures we have in the deck. Instead of Instill Energy, I encourage you to use cards like Wirewood Symbiote or Scrib Ranger. Also, Quarian Ranger, who does the same thing as Scrib Ranger. Now those are cards that you're gonna find in every single Savala list, or at least you should find them there. They are creatures that allow you to untap her only once per turn, but we cheat around that. These are much more effective means to untapping Savala, and that's why we use all of them. They're tutorable, and they also allow you to untap our girl as soon as they hit the field, in the same way that this enchantment does. And still, energy is subject to removal in a different way than Wirewood, Scrib, or Quirion are, and I don't mean enchantment hate. I mean, when I put this card, or I aim to put it on Savala Heart of the Wild, they can just say Unsummon or any bounce spell and quickly eliminate two threats with one stone. Whereas if I play out Wirewood or Scrib or Quirion, they're gonna have to use more of their resources to stop me from getting the untap effect as well as netting a lot of mana on that turn. We have more than enough untap effects in this deck. Heck, we even run Wirewood Lodge that untaps one of our elves. The use of Instill Energy here is found wanting. In most cases, it really failed me whilst testing. It's not a great card in the deck and one I really don't recommend you add in your Savala list. Again, the way I find most people contending with Savala is with a bounce spell. Not a counter, not some form of removal, but really delaying me by bouncing her back to my hand. And that stinks. And unfortunately, that doesn't allow cards like Instill Energy to be effective or is as effective in my deck because of my particular meta. However, if you feel like your deck is in need of more untap effects, Instill Energy is definitely the best way to go beyond all of the cards that are already in my particular deck list. Lastly, let's discuss budget options for our deck. In my hand, I'm holding a string of cards that were requested for review to see if there aren't any good budget options for them. Now, of course, Things like Mox Diamond, things like Monocrypt are essential in CEDH. Now, I'm not going to tell you not to buy them. You need them to effectively play a competitive game. However, if you're operating under a budget, these are cards that are sub $50 that you can replace any one of these with. So, for Survival of the Fittest, we've already discussed this option, but Fauna Shaman in this instance is Fine. This is a fine alternative if you can't afford Survival of the Fittest. I honestly forget what this card is at at this point. I think it's nearing $100, maybe over $90. It's expensive. But for just around $6 to $8 for a foil Fauna Shaman, or less if you get the basic version non-foil, you are getting an excellent card that is a decent alternative to survival. You'll notice these two cards are extremely identical in their text. The only issue with Fauna Shaman is that you have to tap her. So it is going to be a slower game, but it is effectively doing the same thing in this deck as survival of the fittest. So in my mind, budget is anything under $50. And this actually fits in under that. However, I had been asked about it, whether there were good alternatives to Ancient Tomb, and I've got three options for you, but I'm going to encourage you, if you don't own an Ancient Tomb, 
with Uma, our Ultimate Masters that just released. Now is a good time to buy one. There are plenty of versions of this card for less than $50. And you can get these in near mint condition for right around $20 off of Card Kingdom, which is normally where I make my purchases. This is an excellent card to buy. You should buy one. However, so far as alternatives for Ancient Tomb are concerned, I would highly recommend looking into Temple of the False God or Shrine of the Forsaken Gods. Now you'll notice that they do have drawbacks. You need a certain number of lands on deck to be able to activate them for the double colorless mana. That is a drawback to using something other than Ancient Tomb. The only setback with Ancient Tomb is life loss. But if you can't afford Ancient Tomb, those are good options to look at if your games are going a little bit slower than most. Maybe there's a lot of control decks at the table, you're playing against somebody who's playing Blood Pod, whatever the situation, those are decent alternatives. However, it still is no Ancient Tomb. But there's something very similar to Ancient Tomb that you might want to consider. Untaidaki the Cloud Keeper. This is a card that comes into play tapped. It lets you tap it and pay two life, very similar to Ancient Tomb, and it nets you two generic mana to play legendary spells. So there is that caveat. Again, it's slower than Ancient Tomb, and it does have that odd drawback of only allowing you to play legendaries. Love Kamigawa. <laughs> only allowing you to play legendaries. But again, that is an affordable alternative that's certainly cheaper than Ancient Tomb if you want to consider it in your deck. And if you're looking to use Untaidaki, if that's how you pronounce it, to play out a lot of legendary spells, well, it's there for you. Now, Memory Jar in a lot of decks is used as a win condition. It isn't for my primer, but it can be used in conjunction with a card called Primal Command to mill your opponents out, or rather make them draw until they can draw no more. So it's great for that, but we want it for the draw potential. So if you're not using Memory Jar in a loop that's crucial for your deck's success, there's a little card called Slate of Ancestry that might function in the same way given the right conditions. Memory Jar is another one of those sub $50 cards that is a value own. It, it goes into a lot of decks just based off of its normal function. It's essentially a wheel for generic mana. It's great if your deck is hurting for card draw. And I own multiple copies of it. I love the card. I use it in a lot of decks that have a lot of mana to throw out on a turn. However, if you don't want to spend that much, I think they're roughly 20 plus dollars right now. It's, it's a good buy. If you don't own at least one memory jar, buy one. But if you can't afford it, Slate of Ancestry is going to do almost the same thing for Savala List. This is a good Savala card because it's a creature-centric deck. So essentially, you pay for you tap it, you discard your hand. Usually, you've, you've got nothing left after you've played Slate of Ancestry. You're going to be able to draw a card off of each creature you control. That is a lot of power in a given turn. And Savala is netting a, more than enough mana to pay the four cost of admission on that tap. It's really good in this deck if you can't do Memory Jar. However... I would still encourage you buy a memory jar. Now this next card is a bit of a tough replacement and the prices have been fluctuating on this one. I believe as of recording this, the regular version of this card is sub 50, but they've been over 50. Anyways, if you want the regular version, I think it's 30 to $40. It's not a must own card, so I really couldn't recommend it. It's very good, however, for Savala. Uh, and, and on my opinion, a, a essential for this deck. But if you can't afford Phyrexian Dreadnought, I'd highly recommend just adding another buff spell. Something like Groundswell. This is excellent for one green mana, giving you, if you've played a land on this turn, it's, it's not in my primer currently because it doesn't always trigger that landfall ability, but you can get plus four, plus four, maybe not as good as Phyrexian Dreadnought. However, at least the creature you put this on is in most all instances going to be on the field and remaining after the fact. Most instances where you play Phyrexian Dreadnought, you're dropping them and you're expecting them to die. You're not trying to sacrifice 12 creatures worth of power. Again, if you can't do the Dreadnought, just add in another low CMC creature. Maybe, maybe you even put in your Hunted Troll now. Go ahead and try Hunted Troll if you can't do the Phyrexian Dreadnought. But either Hunted Troll or a buff spell. That is a good alternative for this guy. Whew. All right, Guy's Cradle, and I have to admit, even making this purchase myself was extremely difficult. Um, I bought it when they were on a, a peak, essentially. Um, a near mint version of this card was $400 when I bought it, and I, I wanted the near mint one because I intend to own this card and cherish it and play with it for life. Mind you, I traded in a lot of stuff when I bought it. It was a hard pill to swallow. However, I intend to play CDH. This is a card I need. 
if you can't afford to spend that much on a single card. I get it. It's a lot of money. I would recommend, if your playgroup's fine with it, if you're only doing kitchen table, spend the money to get the gold border version of Guy's Cradle. It's not going to go down in price. It is an excellent value proposition. If you want to have an actual Magic the Gathering card in your 99 that's just not tournament legal, get the gold border version. Now, if you don't want to play with gold bordered cards, and my playgroup, we don't care. You can have proxies, you can have gold borders, whatever. But if you don't want to play with a gold bordered Guy's Cradle, and I think it's actually right around $50 too, so even that's a little expensive, there is a good one-to-one -one alternative here. And that card is Nithko's Shrine to Nyx. Look, it's not going to do the same thing Guy's Cradle does. However, in a creature-centric deck with a lot of cards on the field, we can tap this for two mana, choosing a color, green. You're going to choose green. You're going to tap this card and gain mana equal to your devotion in that color. It's really effective in a lot of instances and can actually net you more mana than Guy's Cradle in some turns. However, for most all cases, Guy's Cradle is going to be superior to this, and that's why it's expensive. However, if you can't do the gold border, you can't proxy it for some reason, or you can't get Guy's Cradle, this is a good alternative. Another card folks talk about is a little card called Growing Rights of Itlamok. This is a card that came out in Ixalan. It's a flip card, and when it flips, it has an ability that is exactly Guy's Cradle. However, it's not necessarily a land when it starts. It's not something I usually recommend in replacement for Guy's Cradle. It's a little bit slower, as a matter of fact, so it's not really something I would consider in CDH even. However, it is a good alternative to Guy's Cradle if you want that same effect, but with a setup. And mind you, the top ability of Growing Rights of Itlamok is actually really good for searching for creatures. However, again, you need four or more creatures on deck, I believe, to flip it. That is asking a lot, especially when you are trying to bump your trajectory right on turn three, like get the ball rolling then. You don't really have time to play cards like Growing Rights of Itlamok. So I would, again, still consider Nithkos Shrine to Nyx as a good one-to-one -one land alternative for Guy's Cradle. Here we go, right at that $50 mark. This is Scroll Rack. I own a copy of this card, and this is always what I advocate. At least own one copy of any card. If you own one copy of any card, and if there's someone in your playgroup that detests seeing a proxy or a gold border, you grab that version. But in my deck, Force of Allah, I have a gold bordered scroll rack, and that's totally okay. If you want a budget version of scroll rack, buy a gold border. Again, they're right around that $50 mark. Um, they're cheaper on some sites than others. They, they do come in under 50 if you don't want a near mint version. Again, most of the copies I buy, I try to buy near mint. I want to be the one doing the damage to them. <laughs> Plus, they'll retain more value if they are near mint and you're double sleeving these babies. It's just that from an investment standpoint, it's the way to go. All that aside, get the gold border. If you can't do the actual version, get the gold border. It's totally fine. I'm doing it. However, what if you detest the gold border? You'll never do this. Another instance where Slate of Ancestry can come in handy. No, this is not a one-to-one -one switch, much like the Nithkos to Gaia, but it is more affordable, and in a creature-centric deck, this can draw you a lot of cards, barring that there isn't anything really useful in your hand currently. Again, not necessarily a one-to-one -one switch, but if you don't want Slate of Ancestry, there is one more card you can get as an alternative to Scroll Rack. And that's this bad boy, Sensei's Divining Top. If you don't own the top, purchase a Sensei Divining Top. It can pretty much go in any deck. It's not in Savala, we don't need it there. But it's amazing in so almost 90% of the decks, 90% of all the decks deserve a Sensei Divining Top. It is really good. It is a very good card. Again, it's not really for the draw potential that we're using Divining Top, though we can draw one card on the tap. This is going to let you get the best out of your successive turns. So if you've got one mana floating at the end of a turn, go ahead, use a generic, look at the top three cards of your deck, and propel your game forward with the top. It's fantastic. Again, it doesn't operate the same way as Scroll Rack does in this deck, but if I didn't use Scroll Rack, I sure as heck would be using the top. Lastly, we have our fetch lands collectively. These are very expensive, certainly over $50 if you want a set of matching colored fetch lands in your mono green deck. The only alternatives I can offer instead of these fetch lands would be perhaps 
If you want to thin your deck out still, perhaps using those basic fetch lands, the Evolving Wild, Terramorphic Expanse, those are good alternatives if you can't afford these and still want to thin your deck and get best draws. Those are okay. However, the only caveat with those is that you have to put that land into play tapped. And this is a deck that's trying to go quickly and needs that land now. So getting the lands tapped, not so great. However, there are two more options I would offer up as good alternatives for your fetch lands, and that is Hickory Woodlots and Havenwood Battleground. Now these both have downsides in that they come into play tapped, however they can be utilized if one sacrifices itself or one uses depletion counters to get you to forest on that turn. So not exactly the same thing as a fetch land, however it is going to allow you to turn to a Savala. Never hurts to have more ways to put Savala out on turn two. Also, if she gets countered or blasted, you can use those two cards to put her back onto the field and get right back into the action. So definitely good options if you can't do your fetches. And with that, we've covered mostly everything you need to know about Savala Heart of the Wilds. Again, there are cards that are irreplaceable. Cards like Monocrypt, cards like Mox Diamond, those are cards that just go into CEDH decks. If you can't afford them, that's okay. You should be working up towards getting them if you want to play in a competitive scene. If you buy those gold borders and you don't have the actual copies, you find yourself enjoying the game and you want to take your deck to a tournament, then get those cards. But don't feel afraid to proxy up anything you need or get the gold border if you want to play with power. And trust me, no one should get offended if they see a gold border or a proxy at the kitchen table. It is only at WOTC sanctioned competitions where they should be offended, okay? So don't be too upset if you have to go for the gold border. I understand there are budgets to these things. This is just a card game. There's no reason that people should be spending as much as I did on Guy's Cradle, but I'm, I'm crazy like that, I guess. On that note, are you guys ready to see Savala in action playing against a competitive board? Well, at the end of the month, as promised, I'm gonna get you guys some gameplay with Savala and some of my best friends. I haven't really worked out the format yet. We're still putting all of this together, but I'm very excited to get filming on this. It's promised to be excellent footage of a competitive match with some lighthearted shenanigans in the mix. So join me and the team over at the 99 to watch Savala in action. If you've wanted to see her win on turn three with a heated board, whew, let's see if we can do that. I'm very excited to test my wits against my opponents. It's funny, just composing these videos for you guys has made me a better Savala player, and I hope that all these videos have helped you become a better Savala player as well. Or if you've been fighting against another player's Savala deck, this will help you break them down by knowing the core cards to it. Again, my name is Patrick Marlette, and thank you for taking a look at the 99.